The following Blaco Water Hammer presentation is being conducted by Gary Cornell, Chairman, CEO of Blaco Fluid Control, a manufacturer of pulsation dampeners, surge suppressors, inlet stabilizers, and other fluid control products based in Riverside, California. With a BS degree from California Polytechnic University, Mr. Cornell has worked in the reciprocating pump industry for more than 35 years and is a member of the Hydraulic Institute and the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. Now pay attention to this because two things are going on. Hydraulic vibration and acoustics, okay? So what is this phenomena, okay? And it's, it's hydraulic shock. It's a momentary increase in pressure in a liquid system due to the sudden change in velocity of a fluid. That's the key point. It's not necessarily stopping with the fluid, but a rapid change in velocity, okay? <clears throat> Call water hammer because it creates this acoustic sound or this pressure wave or transient, uh, and it sounds sort of almost like a, a hammer banging on a piece of pipe, okay? Now, since it's an acoustic wave, and we'll talk more about this getting into it, but since it's an acoustic wave, it's not just liquid shifting back and forth, but an acoustic wave. This wave of pressure that's created travels at the speed of sound in water. Now, what's the speed of sound in air? About 1,700 feet per second. In water, it can be as high as 4,700 feet per second this acoustic wave. And that's important for a couple of three reasons, but one of them is it's very hard for an end user or a customer sometimes to understand what's going on when a valve closes 500 feet away, 1,000 feet away, and at the pump there's an action almost instantly. Now we've got our little coil demonstration I think most of you have seen that we built out in the, in the plant and we can create some of that time lag in that situation but um, people don't equate this acoustic wave with the reaction that occurs. So why we're always emphasizing what happened, where did it happen, why did it happen and then it's our job to figure out what to do to fix it. Okay? And and uh, a lot of things can, can vary, and we'll get into it a little bit more, but <coughs> we call a water hammer or hydraulic shock, shock. There's also a thing called surge, and the units are usually called surge suppressors, but surge uh, is a less form, less intense form of water hammer, and typically happens downstream of any valve closing or anything like that, not upstream. So if we have uncontrolled hydraulic shock or water hammer, what's the potential? And you've heard us talk before, it can be to four to eight times a momentary increase in pressure over the normal flowing pressure. Okay, so I was a bit wrong, it's not 17, it's about 1125 feet per second, or it's 47. So with the same intensity, energy pressure in water is 60 times that in air. And that's why submarines have torpedoes that explode below the water line, right? You think about a tsunami and the energy that's carried for literally thousands of miles without dissipating. Water is a very, or liquid, is a very efficient transfer of energy, okay? simple formula that's quite accurate in predicting what this pressure rise will be is using this 60 times the velocity of the liquid in the pipe in feet per second times any specific gravity divided by time. Typically when we're talking about water hammer 
and a valve closure, which is probably 85 to 90% of the applications, we're using one second as a valve closure time, okay? So, if we use this, and this is just a computer-generated graph of what happens when a valve closes instantly, you get an immediate spike and then a tapering off of this acoustic wave. It doesn't just stop, it reverses from where it is. When it hits another solid object, it reverberates back the other way and keeps oscillating until something breaks or the energy is dissipated through friction. Gary, when you say uh, second and when you say microsecond, what's the difference in the microsecond obviously is this faster? Just much faster, much, much faster. Well, you, you can, yeah, now, you know, a second is pretty fast, but in, the, in terms of water hammer, it's a long time. So we're just going through a little exercise here, and we're saying the velocity is six feet per second, specific gravity 1.2, and time is one second. Now, six feet per second flowing in the process system is not all that fast, okay? I mean, there are a lot of places out there that are going 8, 10, 12, even 15 feet per second. Obviously, the faster it flows, the more velocity you have, the more damage that can be done. Mostly about 4 to 5 feet per second, you start being concerned about this phenomenon called water hammer, okay? So... It equals 432 PSI, okay? 432 PSI. Now, this is really important because I've been on the phone and I've heard you guys talking to the customer and the customer says, well, why can't I use a plastic dampener? My pressure is only 20 PSI, right? Low pressure system, so what? Because we don't want to use plastic dampeners for water hammer or surge devices, okay? But the, the problem is, this 432 PSI is cumulative to the system pressure. So you may be at 20 PSI in the system, but now you're gonna add the system pressure to the increase in pressure, and if the system pressure is 100, now we're at 532 PSI. Even taking that away, let's assume we've got plastic pipe, right? a plastic valve, some low pressure gauges, plastic flanges, rated at 150 or 200, 250 even, and we're hitting it with 432 PSI above the system operating pressure. It's a, it's a, a formula for disaster, and it happens all the time. What causes this? We talked about a change in velocity rapidly, right? Valve opening, closing, pump start and stop, pump power failure, potentially one of the most dangerous areas there is, piping profile and direction change, and column separation. There are other factors that can create or increase the potential problem here in trained air because one of the things that we know about and we'll see later on is that for all intents and purposes, liquid is not compressible right? But if there's a lot of air in it, or if it's hot water, there's a lot more air in it. You get that compressibility factor in there, and now we've got a spring that can actually increase that spike as this water comes crashing to a stop. It, it's still moving because there's air compressing in it. Then all of a sudden you get a secondary slam. You know, no. The, the, the sad thing is, no. Um, we had a young engineer that had just graduated, worked for a summer as a seminar, or as a work program with Blake all years ago, Eric. I asked him about that. He said, you know, in four years of college, we touched on this for about 30 minutes. You, you can't believe the number, well, you can, the number of systems that are designed without any concern or thought whatsoever 
for the consequences of valve closure. I took a course from an instructor several years ago who was an ASME instructor. We did a bunch of problems. And one of them I, I always remembered was it was a 36 inch diameter pipe, 10 miles long, and on a slight incline of four degrees, three or four degrees. They calculated, and you can do this, you calculate the time to close the valve which will prevent closing it or slowing down the velocity too quickly. It took 24 minutes to close that valve so you wouldn't have a rise in pressure. Remember the whole key is rapid change in velocity. If you can avoid the rapid change in velocity, you don't have a problem. And of course that's where the Blakel dampener comes in or surge suppressor comes in. Okay. Typically closing within one and a half seconds depends on, depends on fluid velocity. Quick valve closure is similar to a train wreck in a pipeline, okay? Uh, the engine stops, but these cars keep moving, and especially if there's more air in the liquid or more air between them. That first car doesn't, the first car stops, the rest of them still move until you get the big crash. It's, I like to use the, the, the the example of the crash dummy test, right? You've got this block wall, you've got a car traveling at 60 miles an hour, we'll get into this a little bit more, and the car hits the block wall, stops rapidly, velocity changes rapidly. What happens? The energy gets absorbed in the car, right? And the, and the test driver and everything. If you put a spring at the wall so that the car came to hit the spring first, that spring would absorb the energy and slowly decelerate the car so that by the time the car hits the wall, there's no damage because the velocity is all gone, slowly dissipated, right? That's exactly what a Blanco surge suppressor does, and we'll talk about that more. But think about it, the valve closes, right? The liquid is coming full force into the, into the closed valve. If we have a surge suppressor properly charged and sized right there upstream of the valve, the liquid is directed up into the surge suppressor, which is just a big spring, right? So that liquid has a place to slow down, change the velocity speed slowly and no pressure spike is created. And you can see that in that coil that we have. Energy concentrates, it reverses direction, the pressure wave moves at the speed of sound in water, hits the check valve or pump and reverses direction again back and forth. Energy is absorbed by friction after several waves. This uh, is a check valve in a system uh, and we'll do this I think Pressure on the downstream side is usually a drop in pressure depending, we talked about the surge which is on the downstream side of the valve. That's the valve closure and hitting a check valve. Most all pump systems, see there is the valve closing. Most pumping systems Most pumping systems will have a check valve at the discharge of the pump to protect the pump when the pump is turned off. Well, that's the check valve that was slamming. This is that whole system. So to control the valve closure hammer, slow the liquid velocity, use a slow closing valve, <clears throat> use stronger pipes and braces, use relief valves, surge tanks or bladder surge suppressors. You could use any of these. The whole idea is either you're going to have to contain that energy or prevent it from occurring or transforming its, its uh, makeup. I'm not going to go through all of these carefully. One of the things that uh, you can do is control the valve closure time, but typically they say if I want the flow to stop, I want it to stop as quickly as I can get it to stop. So they use quick closing valves. You can use a surge tank 
which is just basically a standpipe. The problem there is you can't keep the air separated from the liquid, so it waterlogs and loses its effectiveness. The bladder surge tank is the best, best permanent, lowest maintenance product you can use to control this surge or water hammer phenomena because it keeps this, the gas separated from the liquid. You all know that. These are just some examples of what can happen now when you're running a pump, and typically a centrifugal, but it doesn't have to be. One of the problems that can occur is when you have a pump start and the system line is full of liquid but stationary. And this is the problem you have with big sprinkler systems. That's why there always has to be some sort of a surge suppressor in these systems because you're starting the flow of liquid against a block wall. And when that flowing liquid hits the solid liquid, that's not compressible and you get a big bang. Okay? The other situation that can cause a lot of problems is when the line's empty. Because now you're pushing liquid rapidly down an empty line that has only air in it. The air is going to move much more quickly without resistance until you reach some point at the end which could be a reduction, an elbow, or any other thing that creates, again, a rapid change in that velocity. Then there are other problems that start making these things complicated, and that's pump profile. And you can have liquid here and then a rise. When you turn the pump off, this area can be filled with air, then down below it can be liquid again. You start moving that liquid against air, and then it hits a solid, non-moving piece of liquid again, and you get all kinds of problems. So some of these get pretty complicated in the profile, and sometimes we have to get help doing these things, but most of the ones we deal with are pretty straightforward. Now, this is what's called rapid pump shutdown, and you're going to see column separation. This also is a, a significant problem because when you have liquid flowing at the discharge of the pump down the line and you turn the pump off, the flow stops coming out of the pump, but that fluid will tend to return or reverse and come back because one of the main reasons is you've got a section of pipe now with nothing in it, no air release, so you lower the atmospheric pressure in this piece of, of pipe and the liquid gets sucked back in. It can be actually sub-atmospheric. You can go below atmospheric pressure in that section of pipe from the pump as the fluid moves away from the pump. Okay? So this is what happens when you... Okay. Now watch this. See it come crashing back? And that's the reciprocating effect. This, and what's happened here is, that's that acoustic vibration reciprocating, but here we're flowing along, the flow stops, the pressure reverses, and all of a sudden we get a big gigantic pressure spike as the flow reverses back to the pump. Now, we don't know how long that pipe is, but that's happening pretty quickly, and that could be a 500 long piece of pipe. This is a, a, a failed pipe underground. How do we start it? Cars going past, there's water on the ground now. A significant water hammer. So watch where that manhole cover is. Look at that. Where is this? This is a this is a testing one. This is somewhere in the United States. I don't know. I got a video from uh, actually that one first came from Wendell Smith over in Chicago. This is big. That's a truck. They're going to manhole cover. It's huge. I have I have a bunch of these. All right, I'm going to go on because <clears throat> so. The ways you control start-stop are to use air relief valves, vacuum breakers, 
slowly opening, then slowly closing a valve at pump discharge, check valve at the pump discharge, surge tanks and bladder suppressors. Sort of the same things you can use before. Again, the goal is to have the velocity of the fluid change slowly. When you have slow change, you don't get a, a buildup of energy all at once. The suppressor acts, we talked a little bit about the spring and the block wall, but the same thing uh, on start stop. If you throw the liquid into the line, you're going to have velocity hitting a, a non moving column of liquid and a spike. But putting the dampener in is like putting a spring in, interrupting the system between the, the pump, which is the hammer, and the rod, which is the, li the liquid stationary in the line. The spring absorbs that rapid start of energy by allowing the liquid to go up into the suppressor and hold it there until the speed of the, of the solid or the non-moving column liquid starts moving. It'd be like, let's say you're, let's say you're, you're gonna push a car that's stalled. You come up to it too fast, you hit the back of the bumper, you get an energy event and break bumpers, right? But if you put a spring on the bumper of the car you're pushing and then come up on and hit that spring first, it'll first absorb some energy and then start accelerating the car in front of you and there's no damage that will be done. Potentially the most dangerous situation of all is power failure, in which the pump is running, producing flow, and they lose power, which is unfortunately more common than people realize, especially in some rural areas and things like that. And what happens is the pump stops flowing liquid. And remember our example of the liquid keeps moving and then reverses direction. And it, it re reverses, and I can't give you the, the formula or the exact wording of it right now, but it reverses at the same velocity that went out. So now it's reversed and it's coming back. Just as it gets to the point of the pump, the pump starts again. It's a momentary power failure. Now we have a head-on collision. So we've got the energy of this liquid coming and the energy of the liquid coming from the pump and they collide somewhere in this area and it's just catastrophic at that point. And again, putting a surge suppressor there is going to protect the system because it gives a spring where these two liquids coming together can go up and decelerate against. Now, in all of these situations we're talking about, with the exception of downstream, down valve stream surge, this our device needs to be placed in the direction the flow is coming. If it's coming back this way, you would have a check valve here and it would hit the check valve and go up in here. If it's coming from the pump, then you want this to flow up into the pump and the check valve would be downstream. Okay, so the energy side basically is where the device goes or suppressor goes. Pipeline profile again can get very complicated mainly because most of the customers don't know it, don't even know their, their profile. But as you drive around the city, do you ever notice on some corners these kind of green little stand pipes with a, a neck on it and a tank? Yeah. You ever see those? Insides of float on a hinge, they're designed to let air out of the underground water system so you prevent something like that. Those are just nothing more than air release valves that are connected underground to the water system. And you see them all over the place if you take the time to look. Water hammer in my review <laughs> is an acoustic pressure transient or wave. Okay? It can occur whenever fluid velocity changes rapidly. And remember we talked about rapidly can start at four feet per second, which is not really high velocity. But I remember doing calculations with stuff with Wilden, and we'd be up eight, nine, ten feet per second. And you've really got a potential situation for disaster when you get to those levels. One of the problems is companies, especially contractors, like to try and get a low bid 
they'll undersize the pipe. Well, to get the same flow out of an inch and a half pipe that you get out of a two inch pipe, what do you have to do? You have to increase the velocity, right? Which increases the pressure, which gives you that base pressure that you're going to rise up or increase when you have this event occur. So anyway, I say five feet per second there. Start looking at it four feet. Um, this is what we need to know. What can happen? Why will it happen? Where will it happen? And then what can we do to prevent it? The toughest thing, when the customer calls us, well, what size pipe is it? Well, it could be two, it could be three. How long is it? Well, it's four or five hundred feet long or two. You know, we can't solve the problem unless we get some relatively decent technical information. So we have to keep digging and digging and digging. Now, <clears throat> this is a computer-generated profile of a valve closure. What you're going to see is this pump profile, and the arrows going back and forth with the oscillation. It'll change from blue to red, and then the graph profile of this pressure spike. Okay, now this is the whipping action. See the arrows changing? as the oscillation occurs and the pressure spikes going all over the place and then the profile up there of the pressure spikes dissipating as it oscillates. And this is extreme stuff, but it happens every single day. Uh, we had one situation with Graham. It, just is, it's a, it was a, a, a diesel filling station for diesel automotives. And they had a Blackmer sliding vane pump, we talked about those the other day, that they would use to pump the diesel to, the, to, the, um, to fill the locomotives. And these are like four inch lines, done manually. Well, when the, when, the, when the tank got filled, the operator closed it, sent the shockwave back, blew all of the sliding vanes out of the pump. So we ended up putting, I think in that case, it was a 40 gallon unit out there. But my point is, this was all designed by an engineering firm Somebody who should have known the potential wasn't even considered. 90% or more of the applications we get into involving surge, and we get them almost every day, 90% of them are after the system has been built and operating, and then they find they have a problem. But after the plant opens and after the first event occurs, then they're scrambling, and sometimes it's really difficult to find a place or a spot to put the units in because they, yeah, they, you know, they, they, and if you don't, if you don't put it in the right place, it's not going to work. Remember, we said this is traveling at the speed of sound in liquid, which can be as high as how much? 4,700 feet per second, right? So. Once that acoustic wave starts moving, you can't capture it. It's going to go right past the stabilizer inlet. But if you put it right upstream of the valve within 10 pipe diameters, right, hits the valve. As it's decelerating, it's right there. It's going right up into the surge suppressor, which is the big spring. The, the spike never happens. When the liquid then stops, the pressure stabilizes, that liquid that's been accumulated against the gas, gas charge just pushes back into the line. No harm, no foul, no problem. You know, that article I wrote was based on a true story at Bear Paint, because it told them, just slowly close. You know, change it from a ball valve or a butterfly valve to a gate valve, like we've got on our um, hose pump out back. It takes about 15 turns to close it. By that time, you're slowly closing it. The velocity of the liquid is slowing down. No pressure increase. But if you take a quarter turn ball valve and, you know, you're stopping it quickly. It was in Ohio at a Sherwin-Williams plant. It had a Wilden two-inch pump bolted to a concrete pad with welded stainless steel tubing. They went up about 30 feet in the air to the ceiling, 
across the plant, came down, and a, and a guy manually was filling totes. Closed that valve. It ripped that two-inch pump off the concrete pad and turned it 45 degrees and bent that two-inch stainless steel piping. I mean, the energy is incredible when we talk about it. Just go stand in the waves and let a wave hit you. Huh? With the velocity and the mass of the liquid will knock you over.